here on behalf of Huntington's Youth Organisation. I'm here with Ashley Clark, as well as Anne-Marie um, from Wave Life Sciences. And we are going to be talking a bit more about their programme. But first of all, I just want to highlight um, at Huntington's Disease Youth Organisation, organization we're committed to breaking down barriers um, and stigmas surrounding Huntington's disease um, and these include pr uh, providing uh, essential education about the latest research and clinical trials um, today we're bringing that conversation specifically about what's happening at we of life sciences and I'm excited to introduce Anne-Marie so if I could start um, Anne-Marie getting you to give a bit of an introduction about who you are, how long you've been in part of the programme and what's kind of your journey getting to here. Thank you, Lauren. So, yes, I'm Anne-Marie Lee Kui Chen. You won't be tested on how to pronounce that later, Lauren. <laughs> and I'm the uh, Chief Development Officer here at Wave Life Sciences. I've been with the company for 18 months, and but neurological disease and research into it is really core. For me, it's something I've worked in for over 20 years. Um, in you know, a previous company, I was leading um, a program uh, called the Tom and Erson program. That was a program also looking to um, find a treatment for people living with Huntington's disease, which unfortunately stopped. And it really, I think, had such a big impact a devastating impact on you know the people living with the disease, their families, the community, but also the researchers. You know, it's it's something that we're really dedicated to, and it's a it's a big blow when something doesn't work. So I was so delighted to come and work for Wave, and for there to be another HD program that I could be involved in, and that's our Wave 003 program, which is a allele selective antisense oligonucleotide. Okay, so um, myself and Ash are here to kind of decode um, any of the complicated things that come up in the conversation and really make this as accessible for everybody at home. So before we get into the nitty gritties of um, kind of what is a antisensal nucleotide, um, uh, Ashley, I don't know if you wanted to give a bit of uh, an introduction onto yourself and kind of what you're hoping to bring into this. I know a lot of people watching this will know you very well. Thank you, Lauren. Um, yeah, hi everybody. My name is Ashley. For anybody that doesn't know me, I work alongside HDYO with their ambassador program and I am also on their board and their education committee. So I am really excited to be involved here today and to meet Anne-Marie and chat about all things WAVE. Um, I can't believe you've worked with neurological diseases for so long um, and it's great to have you um, working on another HD you know trial and that you know it's it's great to have you still with us and that so I'm excited to dive deep into the science of things and mm -hmm. yeah glad I've got both you guys here to help me through it. <laughs> it's a nice thing to hear as well having um I, I've I, I have the privilege of working with a lot of people in the field and, and feel a lot of the um, engagement from people outside of the Huntington's community and how they, once they get stuck in HD, it's hard to kind of let go. So it's it's lovely to hear that's been an, had an impact on you, Amory. So mm -hmm. let's go into WAVE and kind of what their ideology is, what is unique about WAVE, and then we can kind of go specifically into the Huntington's program that you have. Yes, yeah, certainly. So we're an RNA medicines company really committed to delivering life changing treatments for people battling devastating diseases. We were formed about 10 years ago in um, Cambridge, Massachusetts. And beyond HD, we're also working in Duchenne's muscular dystrophy and alpha 1 antitrypsin disease. That's a rare disease that impacts um, the lung and the liver and HD, of course. Mm -hmm. Can I just, so Ashley, your job here is to interrupt at any point when you feel that there's anything you're not sure about or people might want to hear more about. So I'm going to be really mean, Amory, and ask you what um, RNA is, just sure. to get on the most basic sense of work, because not everyone has a scientific background that will be listening sure, to Sure, no this. problem. So hopefully everybody knows that your whole genetic makeup is encoded in DNA, which is in your cells. And the way that um, the encoding is translated is through molecules that are matching the DNA called RNA. 
And um, these RNAs basically encode for all the proteins that your body needs to make to remain healthy. And in um, antisense oligonucleotides, we design single-stranded RNA or DNA to interact with the RNAs to then impact the protein. So for instance, in the case of wave 003, we um, look to silence um, the uh, match the RNA and basically silence the, um, the RNA so that the downstream mutant protein isn't created. And the mutant so, protein is, um, yeah. is something that causes the neurodegeneration in HD. So I, I know sometimes we think of RNA as kind of like a, a messenger or a copy of the recipe for each kind of important right. thing. So in Huntington, they're trying to target the Huntington RNA or mRNA, which are basically the the um, the kind of instructions or invoices to make sent to the factory to to make the order of Huntington proteins um, and then these antisense oligonucleotides, or we'll just say ASOs for short, are trying to um, target those so the factory can't even get that instruction to make the, pro the protein. That's um, right. So it's like we're trying it? to stop the delivery of it. Yeah, it's two things. Um, so you have two copies of a Huntington gene that codes for the protein, um, as Lauren was saying, and that protein is really important for developing an adult brain. And in HD, one mutated copy is passed down from a parent to a child. And that mutation creates um, the, a mutant protein, which causes neurodegeneration. But additionally, it means you don't have as much of the normal wild type protein. And that's you know, important for the central nervous system. So it creates this ongoing tension between the loss of the positive effects of the right protein and the toxic effects of the mutant protein that's building up in, in you know, yeah. the brain. Essentially. When people say about the wild type, that's the, the normal, say, healthy the, the normal the, yeah. the, the type of protein that we want. So anytime we hear somebody talking about the wild type protein, that's the good stuff. And then <laughs> obviously the mutant protein is whenever you've inherited the Huntington's disease gene and you're producing then essentially too much of it. Mm -hmm. of the mutant protein yeah yeah so so is we of trying to own be selective about which 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 copy of um of the these instructions that it's going for so it's trying to get the bad copy rather than this good yeah. wild type that's right so you're probably aware that there's different approaches that different companies are taking and you know i've mentioned one earlier so in what's called a pan silencing approach, what you're looking to do is take down the, the RNA that creates the protein and it impacts both the mutant protein and the wild type protein. But the basic hypothesis is you can find, we call it a therapeutic window. So you can find an amount that you can reduce both, that it will have benefits. You know, there'll be benefit of removing the mutant and you won't have as much impact in removing the good wild types. So that's one approach. Our approach is different. So we have a, a selective allele selective approach. So what we are trying to do is selectively reduce the uh, mutant protein while sparing the wild type protein. And um, the program is you know, focused on SNP3, which is a, um, a specific polymorphism. You could think of a, um, the SNP as like the pin in the map that tells the ASO where to go so that it can seek out the mutant RNA, mutant Huntington RNA, responsible for making the mutant Huntington protein and then save the wild type um, protein, essentially. And just for anyone who, who hears the word allele, um, it's just another word for a copy of a gene, of a specific gene. So you get two copies from your one from your mom, one from your dad. If you one's affected, one has is the Huntington allele, and one is the the good copy, the wild type. <laughs> um, Thank so you, Lauren. I'm sorry, it was like almost impossible for me not to talk in jargon. <laughs> so no, no, it's, yeah. that's why we're here, and that's the beauty of you know this is our skill yeah. set. <laughs> <laughs> that was, was going to be my next question. I was going to be going, Alayle? <laughs> <laughs> but I think this is a, it, it's a really exciting technology. And, you know, you know, I think anyone at home, you, even people that aren't scientific can understand the concept of, yeah, we want to get the bad and, and save the good. Um, so wh why is this, you know, 
difficult to do. And um, you mentioned about these SNPs. Um, did everybody have those or are there yeah, no challenges? Yeah, SNPs are basically then? like single building blocks within your DNA. And um, but p- people have, you know, different SNPs. And so in our SNP3, not everybody has that that SNP3 polymorphism. Um, and so our um, investigational therapy will only work for people who have that SNP3 um, present and people who don't, we would need another molecule to do that. And on the most basic terms, a SNP is just like, when we talk about the letters in our DNA, you know, the code, you know, we know the CAG repeat in Huntington's disease. Yeah. Well, in another part of the gene, there's a single letter change that's unique to that copy or the, that is unique to indiv- certain individuals um, that can be targeted. And if it's, a, if it's on the same copy as the bad Huntington, then you can specifically target that. Um, that's right. So, and so it's quite complex, you know, because you need to have the right chemistry in order to do it. And so uh, we found we had a, a data release um, recently that shows that we are we seem to be able to be able to target um, this specific SNP. And in um, that um, initial data, we saw 20 to 30 percent reduction in Newton Huntington and apparent sparing in wild type um, Huntington study still ongoing of course so you know still plenty we need to do to further interrogate um how and if uh web 003 works so you guys are only targeting snip three but as we said not everybody with the huntington's gene is going to have snip three so yes. how do we know if people have SNP3 how do we find the people with SNP3 because I'm sure for your research you need the SNP3 people so how do you find these guys that's right so for um this study the only way you can identify if you have SNP3 is to be screened and we developed an assay with our partner Assurigen to support this program so what happens in the screening process is a sample of blood is taken to assess whether or not the SNP3 um, is present. Um, And if um, it is, then patients can enter a screening process to see if they meet the inclusion exclusion criteria for the specific study. Thank you. Is it tricky to do that, you know, in terms of logistics of trials, imagine that make, you know, for people who don't know it, in clinical trials, you have to have a check the um, inclusion criteria and eligibility for every trial um, and normally that's a day or two of assessments um, but I imagine there's a bit of a lag in time before you can get the results of testing and stuff and that might logistically make the trial harder to run. Yeah we do the the screening for the SNP3 in advance so that you don't have to go through the screening process for the study mm-hmm. you know without that's knowing whether you already have the SNP3 and it does take a certain amount of, you know, organizational um, planning to make sure that you have everything ready at the right time. But, you know, we have really wonderful investigators and, and partners who work with us to make sure that we execute those studies. Um, and just whenever you guys say inclusion criteria, like that's just, there's essentially going to be like a checklist. And if... I put myself forward for a trial there's going to be like a checklist to do with different parts of like my progression or my age or it could cover like a variety of things so That's if you right. find the SNP3 like in me or in somebody else affected by Huntington's disease they would go down through this checklist then and say do they meet like everything else that the trial requires. That's right so when we do a clinical study we write a protocol which lays out exactly what our hypothesis is what we're trying to test and how we're going to do it you know and what exactly anyone who signs up is going to have to do to be in the study you know what visits what samples Mm -hmm. will be taken um, how you'll be assessed to see how the drug is working and that protocol has to be approved by a regulatory authority in each country and an ethics committee to make sure that um, you know the the scientific endeavor is legitimate and that we're protecting patient safety and producing high quality data. And one of the key points of the protocol is, as you just mentioned, the inclusion exclusion criteria. 
And these are the specific characteristics of the patients that we want in the study that will enable us to answer the question we're asking of the data and will keep the patient safe. And age is always one of the critical things, you know, with HDO, this is of course really um, important because um, children are not small adults, right? They have different risks um, and sometimes, you know, different disease, different benefit opportunity. And so there's many things that have to be really carefully thought out with inclusion exclusion criteria to make sure we're keeping patients safe and to make sure we're answering the right questions and having the right data to answer the questions. So in the case of children, normally specific studies have to be done with different age groups as well of, you know, young people so that we can really understand how drugs are working for, for them in terms of both benefits and risks. And we have a lot of um, our our um, service users that are also young adults that um, are pre-symptomatic and, and um, I know there's a growing kind of frustration or, or want to kind of go earlier and, and things like that or just a frustration that they're parent or loved one can't get into a trial because they don't fit this criteria I always like to kind of emphasize that um uh, you know further emphasizing what you just said Anne-Marie about you know there's a big thing is safety but um these criteria are designed in such a way to try and give make this trial be a success um which is you know what we all want we want a drug to be approved as soon as possible so that's why sometimes the the criteria seems arbitrary you know you have a CAG repeat of this size or people talk about the cap score which is the CAG um an age um comp, uh, product um which is used in research it's not really relevant to people that have Huntington's disease in their day-to-day -day, but it's used as a kind of estimation of where you may be kind of on your Huntington trajectory and for some the different strategies it might it makes more sense to have people closer or later on in their 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 trajectory because they might have a faster progression or um change in their their symptoms might change more quickly which means we can actually measure it easier and this is this is the big thing that goes into the design of these trials is being able to measure the drug is working um, because of the way Huntington's progresses quite slowly compared to a lot of other diseases. It's a, it's a huge challenge for for this disease population to for us to be able to, to say, OK, well, this drug, if this drug is actually slow in disease, you know, we can barely measure a change in their symptoms over two years, never mind if it's caused by a drug. So um, I, this is a bit of a ramble, but it's just to really get hit home to people that they're not there to stop people taking part when, and um, the trial will happen even if you don't get in to it. I know it's never already enough, but um, yeah. It's, it's, I it is. It. So Sorry, it's I was just gonna say it's you know it's clear to see like what you said at the the beginning, Anne Marie, you know, you really care as much as the community do. And that's clear to be seen, you know, how much you care about us and how much you care about, you know, this working, you know, and the SNP three, and I'm I'm calling it the SNP three trial, which is really bad. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's fine. That's fine. The select HD, trial. the study's called Select HD. The select HD, sorry. <laughs> um, I'm just, it's the whole SNP name. It's got me. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, with the SNP 3 being so rare and that, you know, and you have to get screened for it and not everybody has it. You know, how, how many people do we think in the community would have it or, you know, because you are obviously like recruiting for this or recruited for it, you know, you need to find the SNP3 people. Um, has that been yeah. hard to do or is there is there many of the SNP3 out there for you to find? It's not as rare as you might think. I mean, the literature says about 40% and clearly we're getting a more real world experience of that. And as we progress, it will become you know, even more clear what the real prevalence is. But it can also depend on regions, um, you know, where people are located, how prevalent it is. So, I mean, there's enough patients for us to conduct our study. And um, I think what's really important, if we do manage to show that we can selectively, like definitively, selectively knock down mutations, 
type and you know have an acceptable um safety profile as well you know over a long term then we will be exploring other SNPs and expanding this to other patients who don't have the SNP3 so I think there's a it's a really um hopeful period I think in HD with lots of really interesting research ongoing and I think a real urgency in the you know community of scientists to to find something for people who are waiting for for treatments. Um, And I just wanted to highlight sorry Ashley um, for anyone interested in taking part in these trials these are the conversations you need to be having with your neurologist and if you're not seeing a neurologist or taking part in 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 rural HD or things like that it you're further away from being able to kind of get yourself into that conversation so um, it's going to be you have to go to a study team to be seen and be understood so they know that you whether you meet the criteria um that's kind of the best thing about taking part in enroll HD you're reviewed once a year and then study teams know straight away whether you fit a study, uh, one of the trials criteria and they, they would contact you that way and and those people that they've been seeing for years are obviously going to be the first in their mind when it comes to recruiting these so you know anybody's interested in trials please do kind of engage in research as soon as possible or see a clinical team even if it's uh, once a year two times every two years three years um if if you're lucky enough to have a specialist team or center close to you and that's that's like lauren you're pretty much saying like you know if we go and engage with our clinical team or enroll hd or that like our medical teams in our local countries and stuff there's like a big list compiled, like a big database. And this is yeah. where the likes of Wave and other places will go to find who they need and who meets the criteria. And that's how you'll get like chosen for the different trials. So mm-hmm. it's essentially like you want to get your name on that list. if you And even have- for making new research happen in Roll HD and other programs are, are super important for, for clinical sites to become trial sites you know um it it helps that um a company like wave um that are interested in doing a trial in in huntington's go to a clinical site oh well they have this many patients of this disease criteria they have these facilities and they're ready they're primed and ready to do to do studies so you know the more we you know keep adding to the enroll platform um and other research it really does help it doesn't feel maybe like a big contribution individually but every everything is a huge um step towards the our common goal My I, I mean snip threes <laughs> yeah and I mean enroll HD is such an important resource as well because just the the following of people you know who might be at risk of HD over time and maybe develop HD gives really important information to researchers about how the disease progresses so that they can design better studies um, and, and do s- smarter studies that involve fewer patients or get and or get there more quickly to bring drugs mm-hmm. to market. So it's, it is a, you know, a massive contribution that anybody can make that will help further research in general. The information is essentially power for you. Like the more you have, I'm not thinking of the right word right now, you know, the more you've worked with somebody and the more you've watched the progression of the disease in their life and that, it's more information for you. And then, like you said, you can target these studies and make them that way a bit more effective and hard-hitting mm-hmm. and tailor them to what what's happening then in the people's bodies. Yeah, and a big thing is, like, where, um, which is a, a big thing for the HDO community is that, you know, the long-term goal is to move earlier um, and hopefully treat people before they have, symptoms but you know we need an engaged pre-symptomatic community you know taking part in research so we have all those tools and knowledge base ready for as soon as possible so we can do that um you know I've, I've mentioned some of the challenges of, of trying to detect and whether drugs work in in people that have symptoms of HD and it gets even harder as you go earlier and people that don't have symptoms so that's where things like biomarkers will hopefully come through and that kind of leads me to another thing I wanted to chat about here is um 
some news that's been going on in ALS and dementia and other diseases mm-hmm. which have had some other degenerative diseases that have had really exciting news in the last year with some approvals of some of their drugs and I just wanted to get some of your um uh thoughts on that um wait sorry um yeah no that's good I mean I think start with um Alzheimer's disease dementia I mean this is a fantastic example of how when many scientists are going after a a big problem in a very consistent way you do eventually get a breakthrough so um, for Alzheimer's disease it's been very interesting because if you go back maybe 15 years all the um, companies were researching mild to moderate or, or later Alzheimer's disease and as you've said, Lauren, with neurodegenerative disease, you need to intervene as soon as you can in the disease process to help save what makes people who they are. And and so through, you know, literally doing these studies and having failures, the research community realized that they needed to go more early in the disease. And that required new tools to be developed to measure. So in Alzheimer's disease, um, they developed radio biomarkers to look at protein you know plaques in the brain um amyloid beta amyloid plaques in the brain and they you know looked at new endpoints to really measure um how patients disease was progressing and they they pulled data from lots of different studies to better understand like the course of the disease in patients who were given placebo all of that has built and built and built and now led to you know, three, I think three now drugs being approved in Alzheimer's. So it's hugely important. And ALS, I think, is quite similar. We're starting to see many more drugs coming through um, because of the efforts of researchers to really think about endpoints, how to design studies, how to stage, how to intervene as early as possible. And so that's what gives me so much hope for Huntington, Huntington's because there are a lot of companies and researchers in academia focused in this area. And every time we have a failed study, although it's devastating, it's really building on the knowledge that's going to get us to the successful study that brings, I hope, multiple drugs to people living with Huntington's disease. That's what's needed, right, to to serve the community. I know we have had some disappointing kind of trial stops over the last couple of years. Could you comment a bit on those? I know sure. um, there's everything has a different, every trial is different and has unique yeah. circumstances. Um, so it'd be good to hear kind of about those. Sure. So in we had a, a study, it's still running actually, um, called the Focus C9 study in um, ALS and FTD. And um, we recently announced that um, having looked at data from that study, we were going to stop um, the study. I think really on the upside for that study, we saw that the ASO, which is you know the same kind of um, molecule as what we're looking at for HD, it was um, removing um, or like interacting with the biomarker um, PolyGP. So we were knocking down the PolyGP. Um, protein, but unfortunately, that wasn't resulting in um, impact in the clinical outcome that we measure in ALS. And the um, reduction of PolyGP was also not correlating with people doing better on um, the endpoint that we look at for, for that disease. So on the upside, we could really see that we could design a molecule that, you know, that could get to the right place and do what it's intended to do. But unfortunately, it hasn't played out into the effects into the clinic that we hoped, which really points to perhaps from a biology mechanistic point of view, we weren't in the place we needed to be. I think really importantly, it's a different situation in Huntington's Mm -hmm. disease. Uh, Much better understanding of the disease. Um, It's a disease which is you know, simpler as it's monogenic. Um, we know that mutant Huntington is implicated in the disease. And so removal of mutant Huntington should be having um, mm. a benefit. Of course, there's been results with other companies that have been complicated, but this is, you know, I think an easier, should be an easier path for us to get to a treatment in Huntington's. Mm. And for us, I, I think about and reflect where we were. We had another program a few years ago Um an earlier generation molecule um, or chemistry, if you will, 
And with, with those studies, we were looking at SNP one and two. And in that program, we didn't actually even manage to engage the biomarker so to reduce mutant yeah. Huntington. So knowing that we've in this first look at our data have seen that we are knocking down mutant Huntington and sparing the wild type, this is already like a huge step forward. Mm -hmm. Still a lot to do, as I've said, but and you know we, the study is still ongoing, and we would hope to be able to give an update to the community later this year on how that study is going. But yeah, not, there is a lot of be hopeful. Sorry, um, and actually, feel free to cut in at any point. I know. I've, um, yeah. if you I was just going to say you just mentioned there um, about you previously looked at SNP one and SNP two, and now we're at SNP three. So, do we know like? how many snips people like how many snips have we got to play with here <laughs> i can't answer that unfortunately but what i can say okay. is in our previous studies snip one and snip two we were looking at it was completely different chemistry so when that failed we went back to the drawing board and you know further iterated and now um the molecules that we're working on we call them the pn molecules um, that's what was in our ALS study where we did see that we were knocking down mm -hmm. PolyGP and that's, you know, a different molecule, but the same chemistry in our HD program where we're knocking down mutant Huntington and sparing wild type. So mm -hmm. we've taken this big step forward and assuming this study pans out as we hope, we would then go back and look at SNP1 and 2 again using this same chemistry and hopefully okay. you know, bring so, it. So there's a few... Uh, I was going to say there's a few things to consider. So with these kind of drugs, it's you they're basically like artificially generated DNA or RNA. So DNA has a sequence of letters that you can and the clever people at Wave and other companies that create these drugs can can come up with different sequences that will target the specific SNPs or different parts of um so you know finding things that are specific to Huntington in general or is relatively easy um but what we ever doing is pretty difficult because they're trying to get this unique snip and then also um check whether it's on the right copy um so with all of those extra steps it means you might lose kind of strength the potency as we call it um of the drug um but there's also things that can be changed in these molecules like different parts of the chemi chemistry so um they talk about a backbone of these where the letters are attached to in these molecules uh, and for some reason those help the stability of the molecule and affect where it can get how efficient it can get into the brain um it can affect how toxic and and um um in, how much it can cause inflammation um so all of these things are really um, important when thinking about any ASO trials. I know um, a lot of people have heard a lot from Roche and the Tom and Nursing study, which had completely different reasons um, for feeling back in 2021. Um, um, and that seemed to be a bit more of the toxic issues. But now we're, with other diseases and with new chemistry and new backbones, we're seeing a lot more positive things coming out with uh, with ASOs and even a drug that's just been approved for, for ALS in the... Um, I uh, can't remember the name of it. Tefersen. Tefersen. Um, they all have catchy names. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it, mean, it means, you know, that there's ASOs are working um, in different incidences. So there's no reason why we can't get them to work in Huntington's disease. It's my main point. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> We're on complete agreement. We're though. on the same page. <laughs> um okay have you got any questions before we move on to kind of community stuff Ashley I think I'm good and it's going around in my head it's the whole snip thing's got me so it has but no I, I think I'm getting it so I am user target and snip three with the hopes to just lower the Huntington protein which is the bad protein the wild one is the good one I'm loving the names for everything <laughs> um, and you know not everybody's gonna have snip three but we're gonna do our best to find those that we can and hopefully if we conquer snip three we can then look at you know maybe different snips or different ways to adjust you know, if this works, we're excited because then we can take it and go back to the drawing board and come back with like a plan B, plan C, plan D and try and make it work for many other people that, you know, didn't have the snip three. So 
Have I got That's it? That's basically it. Yeah, you did. Right. <laughs> you Perfect. smashed it. Yeah. <laughs> the only thing we had to add is like they've got new chemistry as well. So they're even like more on it molecules. So now yes. that we've got the chemistry as well, we've got it. It's the technical words that aren't my friend, to be fair. No, you're doing <laughs> yeah, you, you got it. You understood it and, and summarized it better than either of us could. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> but no, I'm good. I'm excited to hear you talk about the community summary on, so I'm good. Well, maybe you should lead this then. So <laughs> Yeah. Um yeah, no, um, so it's been absolutely fascinating hearing about all the amazing work that you guys are doing. So I was just wondering you know how do you guys engage with the community like mm-hmm. you know here at HDYO we're young adults we're members of the community and you know different age ranges how do you guys engage with us yeah so we have speakers come into the company to tell us about you know their family situations the diseases that their families or themselves are living with and I personally find that so, so impactful because you know, when you're doing your everyday work, keeping the people in mind that you're doing it for, I think really, you know, drives you and gives you the energy just to keep going through the harder times. Um, We do, you know, patient advisory boards and, you know, with physicians as well, and go to all the conferences and interact with um, groups like HDYO. Um, So, you know, I think that the, the patient part of this or maybe I should say people living with disease because they don't want to make your patients um, is a critical part in delivering what we need to deliver. And there's a lot in the, in general in our space of clinical trials at the moment about clinical trial diversity and making sure that trials are as fit for purpose as they can be for patients. So I would give you an example in Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, you know, these are um, boys living with a, you know, really devastating disease. And it, going into these studies, they need to be in the studies, but to go into that is very disruptive for their, you know, their education, you know, having to miss school to go to study visits. So these are the kinds of things, getting the feedback from patients about and, and people living with disease, what's important to them so that we can better design research to meet their needs is critical and I think really you know makes for better quality research when we have you guys as partners in what we do yeah and it really does sound like you just work with the community you know um like I've met you guys at different events and stuff and it's beautiful to hear that you use welcome you know community members to share their story with your staff and that so you know it's clear to see that you really do care um and you know, we need each other. So we do. So that's always super important, you know. Um, And you mentioned there about like feedback and better, how to better improve these, you know, like obviously young people are maybe starting off in university, college, different education paths, or they're starting their career. And we all remember how scary it was when you got your first big job. You know, how can people taking part or wanting to take part, how can they feed back to we of, you know what they would need to make that happen to encourage them to get into research and you know team up with you guys to fight this fight yeah so I think patient organizations are definitely an enormous resource because companies like ours really go as like a first port of call to get information Um, we are not allowed to contact patients directly um, and so through your you know neurologists who look after you and your families and the patient organizations this is how we make the connections um, to get people involved so that's definitely a good way to go and enroll HD as Lauren said is another way in which you can be drawn into research Lauren was there anything you would add to that um no I don't think so I think um it's just I think it's getting more and more important for younger people um and that's what it maybe would finish with why it's so important for young people now maybe people that um don't know whether they've got Huntington's disease or how to carry the gene are trying to live their life as best as they can or are having young chip families or really busy in their career and it all seems a bit too much to maybe also engage in research and have reminders of, you know, potentially a future you don't want to think about yet. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's 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 going to be so important. You know, I think if things go well in the next five years and we have 
maybe one drug that can can ch- change the trajectory of HD at least a little bit. You know, the next protocol will be going younger, going into people that we're not used to doing trials in and aren't used to getting taking part in research. So this is the time to really get engaged um, and be as involved as you can. So we're really ready to take that fight as soon as possible. This is such a good point because... Um, companies are required to do studies in children in order to get any drug approved in adults you have to commit to a program of research in children which is legislation that was passed you know a number of years ago really global to really try and drive um, better treatments for young people um, at Mm -hmm. risk or with diseases and um, but you know I don't need to tell you, Ashley, that it's such a massive thing to, you know, to really find out whether you are carrying um, the mutation. And I can't imagine how difficult that must be. But I can only say thank you to the people who are getting involved in the research. We absolutely couldn't do it without you guys. And um, we're on your side and we're really rooting for, you know, finding something, even if it's not us. I hope it is us, but I hope it's many companies because you know you guys really need it and deserve um to have treatments that will help thank you so thing much. To, to finish is how many different options there are and how many different companies are are really common at Huntington's disease so maybe a good way to finish is just thank and wave to be part of that and um you know, I, I personally think it's going to be a combination of therapies and this is going to be the first of many generations of even better drugs, even better chemistry. Um, you know, I think there's a hope. I'm going to sneeze. <laughs> <laughs> what a finish. <laughs> and it's not coming. Oh, anyway, <laughs> oh, can, you, can, we, can we cancel that bit? <laughs> <laughs> It's going to be bloopers. Um, no. <laughs> I think we need to leave this in. But um, on a more serious note, I think um, it looks exciting time. And we love the fact that the your, um, Wave have agreed to kind of talk to us in this kind of informal setting. Um, it can be very difficult for pharma companies, for those who don't know, to kind of communicate about their um, research because they're under a lot of regulations and restrictions, you know, th- I, things about not being able to kind of directly contact families and, and patients um so um it's we're really grateful for you taking part in this and maybe this is the first of um, many in the future it's really a pleasure thank you so much for inviting me it's lovely to meet you both and yeah just so much to be excited about right now in this field and yeah. maybe we'll be having a discussion really soon about some you know great advance I really hope that's the case I hope so too. It truly has been amazing hearing all about it today. And thank you both for helping me understand and welcome me here. And, you know, I just wanted to add, you know, I really encourage young people to be proactive, you know, by learning more and engaging with people at conferences and events, you know, um, engaging with the likes of HDYO or even, as you said, Amory, you know, user at events, user on the ground, user meeting people, you know, we can go up and say hi to you we can ask you questions to better understand after maybe been in at one of your sessions and stuff so you know I'm sure all of us on the call here you know we can agree that we encourage the young people to get involved and learn more about the research trust me if I'm here and I got my SNP3 information down everybody can (laughs) you were brilliant (laughs) it will help us further you know make sure that the messaging is clear (laughs) So thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much, Ashley. And I think your credit to the community. <laughs> um, so I think on that note, we'll say goodbye and um, hope to hear from everyone soon. Thanks, everybody, for listening. And see you next Bye. time. Thank you so much.